We have a rather fascinating subject this morning because it comes very close to all of our lives. And uh, it presents also one of the great conflicts of human thought. Our very remote ancestors depended very largely upon some type of religious tradition uh, to dominate their social relationships. The religious world was the ruling world. And uh, while there were many faiths, most people had something beyond themselves that they regarded as important. They also regarded the universe as more or less the product of a conscious purpose deity or a principle or an energy that had real leadership over all created things. Gradually, in more recent times, the emphasis has shifted to science. And today, science is the great opinion maker for the large part of humanity. Science is regarded as a kind of physical god. The sciences are regarded as infallible, far more important than the revelation to Moses on the crest of Sinai. Science, however, in the course of time, like nearly everything else that lives, began to wane as far as its popular acceptances were concerned. The Achilles heel of science became apparent. It became obvious that science could be a very dangerous thing. And just as surely as we gradually outgrew theology because of their dangerous elements, so we are outgrowing science because it is threatening the survival of the human race. We find a strange inconsistency in scientists giving their lives to find cures for things, and at the same time creating the greatest destroyers of all time. So a disillusion of humanity has turned for another leadership. And at this particular time, uh, the leadership that they are mostly dominated by is the leadership of the street and the corner and the drugstore and the shop. The present tradition is largely dominated on by a process of personal beliefs and attitudes. The individual feels that he is going to do as he pleases and that the world is an infinite opportunity and very little responsibility. The new processes of thinking are dangerous also, for from a lack of dominant leadership comes chaos, and chaos ends in crime and ends in all type of private and community uh, vice and difficulty. So we're not very proud of any of these leaders at the moment, but we realize that they have to have a place in things. And we are beginning to come more and more to the realization that our hope rests largely in the religious philosophical area. We are not able to hope that these various materialistic policies are going to endure. They hardly appear before they begin to disappear. Now, if this has some vestige of truth in the thought, then we come to something else. Religious leadership has never as yet resulted in a conformity of beliefs. The religious world is not one world. It has one grand concept, but this concept is so uh, broken down by sectarian beliefs that to the average person, religion is now in a state of conflict with itself. And all kinds of beliefs and doctrines are struggling violently to gain dominance over the human life. Religion, therefore, is now mostly sectarianism, with the various sects breaking all the rules of their faith in that regard to each other. So the religious world has a great diversity, but there's one interesting thing about it that I think we all have to uh, consider that religion very largely deals with matters on which there is no solid basis of common belief. The only power of religion to solve questions and answer the difficulties of life is by a series of hypotheses. 
religion has to depend upon faith. It has to be depend upon acceptance. The individual who rejects it cannot prove why he rejects it. The individual who accepts it cannot prove why he has accepted it. Acceptances and rejections arise largely from personal convictions, antagonisms, or relationships. Out of this, consequently, we have the situation that religion has a wider area of possible solutions to problems than we have generally suspected. If all the religions of the world could get together and combine their common beliefs, we would have certain advantages religiously. There's no question about it. We would find that many religions have items, considerations, specialties that are of importance to us, but which have not been developed in our own faith. Therefore, interreligious understanding can contribute a great deal to the problem of the hour. Now, on the scientific side of this matter, we find a much greater unity. Scientists have a tendency to admire each other almost inordinately. They are very fond of their own research projects, and they're busy as beavers from the time they graduate from the university until they retire, working with some specific situation that entrances them, engages their attention, and dominates their lives. Therefore, the scientist is a dedicated man. But the question is, to what is he dedicated? He is largely dedicated to his own specialization, and he has become a violent and prominent defender of the scientific way of life. To him, this is everything. Now, in order to make science have every, everything be, to appear as he wishes it, he has come into conflict with religion, and in this fight, religion has lost as far as he is concerned. He has placed science as the new religion of all men. Instead of it coming from the prophets in the sky, it comes now from the laboratory and the research groups. And these groups are convinced that they have the answers to everything, and if there are a few points that are not quite settled, they're working on them. They will get them in due time. So that science now considers itself to be the panacea for world ignorance. It also has proved quite an advantage industrially and economically, so that it has become almost the perfect concept of success. It is a success that does not depend upon morality or ethics, depends entirely upon the use of the human mind to solve the riddles and problems of natural existence. I talked many years ago to a prominent physicist, University of California in Berkeley, about some of their researches in atomics. And I asked him why and how they could do these things without realizing that uh, they were endangering the survival of society. And he was very simple and plain about it. He said, we are scientists. We find things. We do not use them. We do not tell you how to use them. You handle them. We give you the skills, and you use them as you please. The moral, the moral responsibility is with you and not with us. Well, it may have consoled him, but it was a pretty hollow argument for the reason that when you place a dangerous weapon in a person's hands, you have certain responsibility if that person uses it wrong because actually you have provided him with the means of destruction. There is responsibility in the revelation of matters which are too dangerous to be suitable for public consideration. But anyway, the scientist has relieved himself, in many instances at least, of all moral and religious responsibilities. He may be personally more or less a religious man, his family may go to church. He may be sending his, some of his children to parochial schools because he dislikes the present situation in the public school. He has a certain code of his own. As one of them told me, he said, I am a scientist six days a week and a religionist on Sunday. 
He doesn't allow, however, Sunday to impose upon any of the other days. So therefore, we find here in, in science a very high, a skilled, intellectual, mental, experimental form of life, which, however, is without any broad concept of anything beyond physical existence. Therefore, when we come down to the third division, we come into the realm of what might be termed popular opinion. Popular opinion is growing in power all the time. Popular opinion is very largely the individual contemplating his own experiences and deciding what to do next in order to advance his own objectives. This new person can be quite religion, religious, but never allows it to interfere with business. He may be an idealist in parts, but most of all, he is resentful of the policies that run the countries. He is resentful of the waste of resources and energies. He objects to most of the customs and many of the opinions of science. He has not any great sympathy with the political structure. But what does he have in its place? He has only to fall back upon what I think is right, what I believe I can do, or what I am going to do, regardless of whether anyone else likes it or not. So in the midst of this, we observe that we have gradually come to an impasse in which every value of our lives is located and locked upon the physical surface of things. Modern religion is thinks in terms of the need for larger institutions, more churches, and higher paid clergy. Science wants more money for laboratories, it wants more research funds, and it is hard at work advancing its own purposes on a physical level. The public in general wants luxury, success, fame, and a good time. Now all these do not add to very much. In other words, what has the world as a basic form of leadership? How can we control and direct the resources of our world unless we have some kind of a concept of what is necessary and what is next? This seems to be totally lacking. We are more and more in debt all the time. Responsibilities increase, general dissatisfaction changing to terrorism, and still there is no major power to hold the world together. The most successful power that ever attempted it was, of course, religion. It was the only power in the ancient world that permitted the, even the shadow of civilization to appear. The other forms have been completely localized on a project of one kind or another, and that project has not been basically security for the human being. It has been based largely on the, the use of this world as an arena for personal profit, advantage, and happiness. So here we are now in the closing decade of the decades of the 20th century with less perspective on life than probably ever before. Here and there voices are raised, but the entire situation is heavily clouded by an all-enveloping materialism, which is leading to war, leading to all kinds of tyrannies, and leading definitely into chaos unless we do something about it. Now against this, what do we have in real organization? We have only one thing, and that is the good intention of sincere people. Many people see the fact as it is, but not many of them are in a position to do anything important about what they see. They can only hope to regulate their own lives to the degree that they will not be involved in the uh, discrepancies and disadvantages that exist around them. Now one example of this that we want to take up this morning is a phase of this particular problem. And in this phase, of course, has to do with hereditary factors. The large world heredity, we know, it began with the creation of the planet. 
and everything upon the planet has inherited something from the beginning of the very planet itself. We are only here because we have inherited from the past everything that we have here. We are here because we have the latest expression of a long existing search for something. Every generation has had a seeking factor locked in it. The definite effort to know more, learn more, and do more. And we inherit from the past all of our sciences, all of our theologies, our trades, our crafts, our skills, our educational system, our economics, and our industrialism. All of these things have been handed to us as part of a natural heredity. This is just as genuine and just as real as any aspect of heredity applied to the personal development of a family. Actually, therefore, we are the heir to the ages, and we are confronted with a very interesting problem, and that is the age heredity has gradually failed or is failing. We are bringing down into the present generation most of the vices of the past, which theoretically we should have begun to correct. We have been handing an unfinished business, and we may say that the small child coming into the world through physical heredity is also handed a world of unfinished business, much of it probably not to be finished by him or in any one generation. We are all inheriting unfinished business. We are inheriting a mess that was bestowed upon us by the thoughtlessness, selfishness, and brutality of the past. We have inherited a religious confusion. We have handed a breakdown in our philosophical system. We are now working with a decadent science that is complicating life and solving very little. Some areas are successful. We do not deny that we are also inheriting good things. We are inheriting much that can be of great value to us. But so when we inherit the tools of progress, we are now using these tools very largely to block progress. We have gained a great deal of insight, but the average person is not benefiting from it. We have got more scientific skills than we ever had, but it's becoming prohibitive to pay for one visit to a physician. Everything that we have has been variously, privately turned into profits. And the great problem is that we have inherited a situation in which a vast economic structure that has been here for tens of thousands of years, from the days when we use wampum and cori shells down to the present time, it has always been bankrupt. And we have been struggling main to maintain forever a system that has never worked. But we don't have anything better to use. Now, one of the reasons why systems have never worked is because of all the things we've done and all the thinking we've done, it's been only a few rare persons who have realized that there were rules that had to be followed. And that the reason we are in this miserable mess is because we refuse to accept the rules that would solve the mess. Now, science can't accept rules other than those of the laboratory. It has a certain power to distinguish infinite order, law, and consistency throughout the structure of the universe. Science has to succeed in its experiments because it discovers the laws governing those experiments. Everywhere science turns, it is confronted with laws that cannot be broken. This is accepted on the level of science, but not on any other level. If a person with recognizing the mathematical laws of science starts to apply these to the moral laws of personal life, he will lose his scientific standing. He is not presumed or assumed to have any interest in anything beyond a vast mecha mechanized universe, a universe which is actually one incredible machine. Who invented it, no one dares to ask. Why it was invented in the, in the first place, no one is very sure. 
The only thing everyone seems to realize is that we are small wheels, cogs, or batteries in a vast organism so great, so stupendous, that we can't even describe it correctly. So we have this problem of the individual and his conflict with laws as they are. Now, we take hereditary conditions as brought out largely through Mendel, and we begin to say to ourselves, what does this all add up to? There is an individual who has a nose a little like father's nose, and a disposition that is always analyzed in one way. Uh, the, when the child comes along and develops all of the unpleasant characteristics that may arise, the mother knows they are from the father's family, and the father knows they're from the mother's family. And these delinquencies all together result in the firstborn son. Now the uh, problem of these things are very interesting. Many people look very much like their parents. There's so much that makes it look as though Mendel was right. Then there is the problem of uh, various uh, indebtedness factors, talents, abilities. Of course, here we have a breakdown on some of it. I have met the uh, children of a number of geniuses, and I assure you the children did not show any symptoms of genius. <laughs> Uh, the, uh, the son of the great scholar is very apt to turn to some very much diff very different procedure from his illustrious forebear. But the physical resemblance is there. And very often there are peculiarities of appearance, disposition, bodily structure, a color of eyes, all these things, and tendencies that look very much as though they were handed down. So we come to heredity with a rather interesting situation. Do we exist as people? Or are we simply the last bundle of our ancestors? Is there any person there at all? Are we partly dependent upon the individual who was hung for piracy in the 15th century, <laughs> who scalped Indians in the east and western part of the United States, and who probably went to uh, Australia to serve a prison term in the middle 19th century. Who are these ancestors? Are they the highwaymen? Are they the corrupt uh, officers, the decadent aristocrats, and the belligerent uh, clergy of long ago? Who are we? Are we merely the present appearance of a long stream of contributing factors. And what we call a disposition or a temperament is merely an arrangement of dispositional peculiarities from the past. Are we there for people at all? If I say something, am I really saying it? Or is it something that has, was said by my great-great-grandfather long ago? and somewhere it locks into the chemistry of my own existence. If I look like an ancestor, and maybe a mixture of several ancestors, and a mixture of several bloodstreams, back as far as you want to go, far further than you can go in heraldry or the genealogical uh, charts of the European aristocrats, who am I? Am I really a person at all? Now, if you carry the Mendel theory far enough, personality breaks down into a combination of, of former existences and present confusion. Uh, largely, the ultimate picture being somewhat like a cast of the dice. It depends on how things fall, who you are, what you are, and why you are. Now, this seems to be a little inadequate there must be something about this situation that is more than the individual reliving his ancestry and passing the little more of the same on to his descendants. Are we really people? When I have a temper fit, it's based by because my uncle had a bad disposition. If my morality is not good, is it because I had a relative who was dissipated? We, these things don't fit together. 
And the reason they don't fit together is that they combine for the first time a certain sense of relationship between religion and science. The Bible tells us that the sins of the parents shall descend upon the third and fourth generations. And Mandel says almost the same thing. Here we have, therefore, a scientific attitude based upon the Pentateuch and uh, actually re representing the idea or perpetuating the idea in miniature of the grand scheme which has dominated Western theology for over 2,000 years, summed up in the little l lyrical statement, with Adam's fall we send us all. So here we are, the remote de descendants of Adam, all bringing to this present generation, generation after generation of corruptions and misdeeds, all the way down. Somewhat from Genghis Khan, something from Alexander the Great, and more recently a little dash of Adolf Hitler. These are the things that we have to think about. Now science really has no answer to this, except it's re regrettable but true. Religion at the present time, as we know it, doesn't have too much to offer either. There will never be a solution to this situation as long as we hold the attitude that heredity is equal to a secondary creation. That heredity is a situation in which from nothing comes something that is the sum of previous miscalculations. Sounds good. Might get a good mark for that on the examination paper. But it still has no answer to what we're looking for. So this brings us our first challenge, and it's something to think about. Is it possible that some source of knowledge on these subjects lies outside of the smug circumference of Western thinking? Is it possible that religion, as we know it, is not the only religion that has any answers for things? And is it also possible that some religions cultivated in other areas by a different type of person with a different background, and maybe a different heredity if you want to talk it that way, might have some answers for us? And I think there is an answer. And I know that it will be difficult for some people to accept, but I think we have to bear it in mind. When we are talking about heredity, I think we are saying exactly what Luther Burbank said when he cross-pollinized plants, that he was able to prove conclusively that the strains of these plant colors and forms and structures were unbroken over a vast period of time. And where they appeared to be broken, they were revived again at a later time by combining red and white roses Burbank got some red roses, some white roses, and some multicolored roses. After a while, he took another white one from this group, cross-pollinized it again, and got all white ones. He took from these another example and bred it again with an all-white one. And this went on eight times in which white remained dominant and the other colors never showed back. On the ninth time, the red came back. It was carried all that time. Now this is something kind of interesting. Suppose we take now for this situation, suppose we assume what religion has to give us. Primarily that we are not merely bodies. We are not monkeys standing on their hind legs. We are not simply physical structures. Birth is not merely the creation of a new life by a physical process. All of the things that we have associated in a materialistic way with the creative and prog uh, progressive processes are examples relating to only one thing, physical matter. We are dealing with the possibility that in physical matter Burbank's rose can come back red. In physical terms, we can say that somebody looks like his grandfather. We can find the family traits coming all the time 
But every one of these traits is in some way related to body and not to the dweller in the body. We have all of these traits and we have something that brings them into organization and causes a vitalizing factor to animate a new body. But this is a body. It is a perpetuation of heredity by form only. And by this you can maintain the principles of Mendel and his uh, successors very clearly. But he is only talking about body. Nearly all science is concerned only with body and does not dare to go beyond that. Anything beyond body is merely energy. Anything beyond energy remains unknown. Therefore, what it seems to me our problem is, is to find a philosophy of life that gives us an understanding that we have a life apart from what we have inherited from the past. That we do not have to make the mistakes of our ancestors, even though we might look like them. Because actually what we are getting by this process of generation is body. Now if this body does not receive a quickening at the proper time, this body remains comparatively worthless. If the uh, inner life of this body is destroyed, the outer life becomes meaningless. And somewhere in the picture of things there is an inner life that inhabits the body but is not identical with it nor created with it nor perishes with it. This brings us to one of the most important problems of our thinking. What happens to us when we die? If the materialist is correct, that is the end. And that which was born to suffer, born to learn, to hope, to fear, to love, born to learn something, becomes extinct. Now, science is hard put on that one, but it has come up with something that I think it assumes to be sufficient. Surely, Professor Jones, the great chemist, is no longer existing. He's gone. He's dead. And when it's dead, he's dead completely. There's nothing left of him except what is in a little box in the crematorium. But... He has an immortality. He is remembered by his brother scientists. He lives on as a genius, as a great man and a respected man. He lives on also uh, f from the, for the consequences of what he did. If he found the cure for yellow fever, that makes him an immortal. And his achievement is, uh, is eternal and immortal but the professor himself is stone dead. Now, science seems to feel that this fame factor is the final justification of what man accomplishes in the material world. Of course, even scientists looking back finds that the heroes of one generation are not the heroes of the next. And the scientists of 500 years ago have very little rating here today except as ancient brethren who did what they could. So the Professor Jones, who's gone forever, sometime becomes one of the ancient brethren who did what he could but made mistakes that the next ten generations had to correct. So here we are with an individual who is born by an act of generation, who has no existence before birth, except by a chemistry he is going to be uh, a problem of electrical reactions. Then he goes through these tender years of life, failing, gaining, succeeding, hoping, fearing, seeking perhaps to be a better person, wishing desperately to grow and to be uh, worthwhile, and then in due time passing through infirmities and fading away. Now this is the materialistic attitude of life which dominates, whether we admit it or not, the larger part of humanity. If they deny it, they still live according to this concept. Their action every day 
is eat, sleep, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow we are going to die. And in death, that's the end of it. Now, to some, the escape from the old idea of perdition, purgatory, of Hades, uh, this seems to be a consoling something. It is better to be non-existent than to be punished forever. On the other hand, why should anybody be punished forever? Even assuming that there are some awful rascals in this world, forever is a long time. <laughs> so, the, the whole theory, is, as far as it is intellectualized, is very, very unsatisfactory. So we look somewhere else and we have to say, the only answer to this is that there must be some difference between the person in the body, as Carl Jung calls him, and the body itself. These two cannot be identical. The, come, the creation of the body is not the creation of that which lives in it. The death of the body is not the death of that which lives in it. We can change garments as we find in the Hindu classic, the Mahabharata. We cast off old garments, but we take new ones. Somewhere in this pattern of things, there seems to be a need to differentiate between the person and the house he lives in. Now, it's true, he may have inherited the house. He may have inherited a palace, a good body. He may have inherited a hovel, a bad body. He may try to build a better one on the property that he already owns, personal improvement. He may waste and neglect the wonderful body that he inherited that was a palace, and as a result of its foreclosed over his head and he is bankrupt. <laughs> so all kinds of things can happen to bodies. But these things that happen to bodies happen because there is something in those bodies that is, in a sense, separate from them. A, a someone living in the house. And to build a beautiful house with no one living in it is not good either. If the body is all there is, the whole theory of existence is a dismal failure. And it's a little bit difficult to assume that a creation as splendid, magnificent, and exact as ours is based upon a failure or leads to one. We need to see something else. So looking around uh, the world, we find various peoples. We find, for instance, in Christian religion, they, there is very little statement as to the condition before birth. The religious group in the Christian group generally does not regard uh, a person as existing prior to physical birth. Therefore, he has what my old friend Dr. Bronson called it. He works with a one-ended stick, a stick that has a beginning but no end. Something that is created, but never terminated. And this doesn't quite work out either. Also, we have to recognize that we've got about five billion people on this planet. We've got five billion bodies, we're having trouble enough with those. But supposing we tried to understand the five million something or other that lives in, that, in those bodies. And that this that comes in these bodies comes and goes leaving bodies, gaining bodies, deserting bodies, but the thing itself remaining alive. So we go to one country and one religion that has made a great deal of this, and that was Hinduism, which gradually, of course, was modified to form Buddhism and Jainism and many other Eastern sects. But the whole concept of Buddhism is based upon the idea that the life in every living thing is eternal. That bodies are beads upon a thread, and that the thread itself runs through all the beads. It is only in this way that a life can be meaningful. If I have only one existence and do not survive that existence, then what, is, what are lessons worth? They're nothing. There is no sense in existence 
unless that which is in the body is separate from it. Lacking this difference, there is no meaning. And yet today, the individual who believes in God and believes this, believes that there is something in that survives, has no realization that this surviving thing has an existence after death that cannot be summarized in the simple statements of heaven and hell. We have to realize that as far as Western theology is concerned, that which is before birth is of more or less of a vacuum, and that which is after death is more or less of a bedlam. Nothing works out. The creature is punished forever for something it did not know enough to avoid. A creature underprivileged, poor, and impoverished is penalized forever for stealing a loaf of bread. Their right and wrong take into consideration no factors except the most literal physical interpretation of everything. And these physical interpretations have been dramatized to become theologies. But actually, they are merely a fact that we have to admit Basically, that the answer is not being completely available. We must study nature, contemplate upon the processes of existence as we can understand them, and gradually recognize that all these arts and sciences are steps of a ladder that leads up to something we haven't reached yet. When we find it, we are going to find that we are living things in a universe of eternal life and that all these other problems are man-made, imaginary, or created to enslave human minds. So having come to some such a conclusion as this, for instance, let's assume for the moment that the Buddhist philosophy, which is probably the one most simply explaining these problems, has some integrity in it when it points out that the human being is an eternal creature. And that every human being, saint or sinner, is subject to the same evolutionary process of regeneration and redemption. In Buddhism, there are no lost souls. There are some that are a little sluggish and linger long than, are, than necessary, but there are none that is lost. Therefore, if this is true, the individual comes into birth and remains for a certain number of years, and then retires from the physical scene of things. But in retiring, he does not cease. In retiring, he does not go to some ultimate that he cannot understand. He does not go frightened as a slave into the unknown. He goes as he was and as he is, no better, no, no worse, than a human being working toward the improvement of the eternal part of himself. This concept carries with it, however, of course, a, a, an opinion that is gaining interest rapidly in the West, but was long regarded as, with an, as anathema by most Christian sects, and that is reincarnation. Reincarnation is the only solution that is available that prevents the human being from destroying himself. It prevents him from being the subject of universal injustice. It prevents him from ever being able to perform any action that has no meaning. Everything is meaningful. If every day he does the best he can and he tries to improve himself, this improvement goes with him. It does not end in the cemetery. Everything that is real about him goes on. Nothing is lost but the body. Now that this body may be a perfect image to the Mendelian theory of heredity, we accept. The body could well be a more or less graveyard of ancestors. It could be the repository of all kinds of physical peculiarities, of appearance, of disposition, of physical constitution. It could be the basis of a situation 
which has two outcomes. If the body is not the person, but the person is in the body, one of two things are going to happen, is going to happen. Either the person is going to dominate the body, or the body is going to dominate the person. If the body takes over to a certain degree, it protects the person. It protects the body, it protects the person from natural disasters or from various situations that are prevented on the bodily level. If, however, the person takes over the body, it then becomes the instrument of self-expression, self-development, and to a very large degree, a revelation of the basic potential of the self in that body. Are not saints coming into flesh? Everything that comes in must come in right in the condition that was in when it left. There is no great transmutation caused by death itself. There is, in the certain levels of growth, after the growth becomes well established in consciousness, there are experiences in the after-death condition which help to per permanently contribute to the growth of the person. But for the general purpose of matters, the individual who was no good when he passed on is not going to be elegant when he comes back. <laughs> He's going to come back just about what he was before. But he is going to come back again with the possibility of growth. If he was stunted in one life or became a hopeless alcoholic, in the, in the experience of this in his consciousness, may cause him to be more careful, more discriminating next time. But the coming in, he will come back according to what he was when he left. Now, if this is reasonable, and it seems to be the only answer that makes sense, then we have an understanding of how the appearance of the Mendelian theory has been possible. Let us assume that... Uh, with reincarnation, we also have the concept of karma. Now, karma we think of largely as punishment, which is an entirely erroneous approach to it. Karma is consequence. Is consequence. It is the result of that which is done. It can be the result of that which is not done. But it is a consequence, not a punishment. Karma, therefore, as consequence, uh, may have a great deal to do with the embodying of a life. It is going to bring an entity back. It's going to bring a self back into an environment suitable to itself in the state it was in when it was deceased. Therefore, it is going to come back with the same infirmities, it is going to come back with the same potentials and the same responsibilities. It will probably return in very nearly the same cultural, racial, religious environment it was in before. It is going to be of whatever organic quality it was before. It is going to come into an environment which is the next step for itself. It is not going to come back in a great and noble way if there was no greatness and nobility in it. Here we see one point in which perhaps there is some error in the doctrine of Buddhism. But it may also be that we need Confucian to mend that wound. But in any event, as Buddha pointed out, karma as punishment brings back the being into a condition similar to that which it caused for other people. The tyrant, therefore, becomes a victim of tyranny. Uh, the licentious person is born back into the same moral deficiencies. The egotist comes back as egotist. The physical accumulist who can think of nothing but money comes back that way. And it would be natural, it would seem, and quite reasonable to assume, that under these conditions, the entity will come back in a Mendelian body suitable to its own need. In other words, in a long line of heredity, 
we find a whole sequence of desperados and delinquents, an entity seeking embodiment would probably come into, one of the, into such a family where it would be exactly what it was before and will be mistaken for the fact that it inherited these, this, these limitations when reality it was these, limit, was these limitations which brought the entity back into that family. Therefore, the individual returns in an environment suitable to itself and becomes unaware even of its previous existence until sometimes intuitively or mystical experiences these factors break through. It is almost certain that the psychic chemistry of the parents is going to determine in, from a hereditary standpoint the type of being that will be brought into embodiment. And having brought into this being into embodiment, the parent has to learn their lesson, which is part of the hereditary pattern, and has to help the new entity coming in to its lesson in their life, family, and environment. Therefore, it would seem that rather than to assume that the individual has no existence before birth, no existence after death, that this is an oversimplification. It is a simplification that is intriguing to individuals who are afraid to contemplate immortality, that do not wish to so live that they would want to endure beyond the present body. They want to make the most of what they have on the basic concept that to have everything they can now is better and whatever lies ahead doesn't mean anything anyway. Any individual who believes that consciousness is eternal even though the body is not cannot live that type of a life without coming in serious conflict with conscience. And it is better to deny the whole thing than to give up the false pleasures of the hour. So we have a world many of the citizens living here almost hoping they're going to die and those who are hoping hoping it's the end but a civilization that produces only those who hope to get out of it is a, a, a more or less of a failure in its own right it isn't a, it isn't very good so what we are trying to think out through that this is this is the answer scientifically religiously and philosophically that there is a separate entity in the body that this entity enters into the body as into a house or into an establishment of some kind it enters in and takes over the control of that house and in the process of control it gradually assails the hereditary pattern in the house in other words the body is a rate of vibration in the, or a mixture of vibrations and the entity coming in must finally make this uh, body suitable to its own purposes. Therefore, there is going to be a process going on constantly in which the individual seeks to, con uh, to escape from the tyranny of heredity. It seeks to take this body and make it a purpose vehicle for its own action. If it achieves this, it becomes an individual. If it does not achieve this control, it then drifts through life until life ends. But the, most of the great experiences of life have arisen in persons who have gradually created or released into expression their own inherent superphysical propensities. In other words, the being coming in gradually places its own stamp which Bailey calls the signatura rerum upon the flesh, gradually transmuting the body into the likeness of its own will and purpose. Now, if this will and purpose is unenlightened, as it is in many cases, the body is going to be abused. The body is going to be tyrannized. Dissipation is going to set in. And a despot is going to run this wonderful mechanism that we call our corporeal constitution. If, however, we are reasonably thoughtful and somewhere along the line become a little interested in health and in the protection of the body 
gradually the body becomes what it was intended to be, an appropriate dwelling and a useful servant of the being that dwells within it. This problem is therefore the problem of adjustment, <coughs> fitting the uh, being to the body, giving it an, an integrity in the body which has been formed. To continue this problem is uh, a little further, having gained a body which has its problems, the entity then begins in childhood to mold this body into the likeness of itself. Now here is where parental help is very essential, but see, this is often not available. It is the purpose of the parent to give every possible advantage to the being by the proper disciplining and controlling of the body in which it lives. Parents have got to recognize a responsibility to the invisible being in that body. And they have to also realize that that invisible being is not a baby. That invisible being is a creature gradually coming into embodiment that probably is just as old as the parent. Therefore, from the beginning of this idea on, there is a gradual development of a democracy of relationships in which children are no longer created simply to amuse their parents or prevent a broken home or as a tax exemption. They are there to have the opportunity to achieve the proper evolutionary growth which is natural and right to mankind. The child, therefore, is responsive to many things long before it is assumed to be able to be educated. One other thing is that when the education does come, if the education is centered completely upon body, and the being in that body is not too strong, that being is going to be in slavery to the world of bodies. It's going to be enslaved to business, enslaved to industry. It's going to be enslaved to a job. It will be just as much a slave as the South held slaves prior to the Civil War. And as the body becomes the slave of a delinquent uh, environment, the being in the body is, is conditioned adversely. That was why Comenius, I think, was so insistent that the first parental responsibility was to assist the being in the body to become aware of its divinity, its proper destiny, and to establish in that body proper moralities and ethics until the being itself is old enough to take control. Therefore, all the way along, the child should be regarded as an unfolding life principle and not simply a body generated here on earth. It is very often difficult to handle some of these cases. But on the other hand, where a child comes into a home that is so structured that the child's inner life is not going to get much attention, it is also true that that is a life in which the parents have not done too much. Now, they may have done the best they could. They may have done all that they know how to do. Uh, but somewhere along the line, the difficult problem for the child becomes also the difficult problem for the parent, and both must solve their difficulties. Now, solution is not a simple uh, platitude. Solution is the constructive use of proper means to do everything that is possible to maintain the proper relationship between the entity and its body and between the bodied entity and its family. These things have to be worked out. But if there is some appreciation of the values involved, there will be less tendency to simply block the whole thing out. Forget it. Ignore it. We won't have so many young people on narcotics if they could realize that this is not just one little life, one little experience, and then after that comes nothing. 
The hope of oblivion is strong in most materialists and is one of their great weaknesses. While they are satisfied in this, you cannot do too much about it. But no materialist can claim legitimately to be truly thoughtful. He cannot be a philosopher. He cannot be an idealist. He cannot have any of the religious overtones which are necessary to survival in a materialistically oriented culture. The only hope we have today of maintaining a proper attitude towards the changing world around us is to strengthen our own integrities in every way possible so that we see more and more of the eternal purpose behind what appear to be the absurdities of human conduct we will find that all of the different things that seem to us impossible, if they are impossible, will be so demonstrated by a power greater than our own. Actually, if this universe was created, and some scientists do not believe it ever was created, if it has some kind of a spiritual power at the source of it, and this is denied by a great many people, if it has any moral code, any justice built into its own structure, this must triumph. And if it has none of these things anywhere in it, then it is impossible to explain an ordered sequential process. It is impossible to study the vast emergencies of heaven, the great patterns of cosmic time and progress, the immense variety of infinite life, the magnificent chemistry of existence. It's impossible to study all of these things with an open mind and not realize that somewhere in this pattern, as Lord Bacon says, there is a universal mind without which existence could not be. And that there is nothing that we can study, nothing that we can learn that can save us from our own emergency unless we admit that somewhere there is integrity. If, if, if there is universal integrity, then creatures are treated properly. If there is a divine good at the source of life, that good does not promote and sustain evil. What we call evil, then, is our own mistake coming home to roost. We do things wrongly and we suffer. This is not due to the evil of a powerful spirit of, de of uh, reversal. It is due to our own failure to understand life. But whatever it is, uh, wherever there is a punishment, it is because of love and not because of hate, and it certainly is not originating in something that does not know the difference. So I think we begin uh, in philosophy, certainly, and in enlightened religion, by assuming that this plan is purposed, that it is an exact plan, that it is exactly just, and that all injustice arises from a conflict between truth and human error, that our own mistakes create the troubles, and that we are reminded of this time and time again and if we look around us, we are being reminded of it every day right now. We are beginning to realize that we cannot be as foolish as we have been and survive our own folly. This is coming home. We know it now. We are beginning to think in terms of it. We are breaking through because gradually we discover that inside of this body which is giving trouble, there is something that is capable of thinking about these things that the dweller in the body has also the power to gradually come forth and correct its own mistakes. And by so correcting them and by so understanding the process, setting up a proper and reasonable way of life. In the uh, old beliefs of some nations, the, uh, there was the opinion or the teaching that great sages of the past took flesh and dwell among us. This may or may not be. We are not trying to explain whether the Rishi of India or these great souls are here or not. But one thing is certain according to all philosophies of importance, that the enlightened ones do exist. That enlightenment is in the keeping of the enlightened. And that the enlightened have only one dedication, 
No one can be truly enlightened except when he is truly and completely unselfish. The truly enlightened labor for the common good. The stupid labor for their own good. And as a result of laboring for their own good, they are wrong. And troubles come in. Um, unemployment comes in. Uh, exploitation comes in. All kinds of troubles come where the individual tries to live on the level of his body. If he is trying to live only in a world of bodies, in which buildings and machines and beings are bodies only, and has nothing beyond these with which to contemplate existence, then this is a very dismal affair. And uh, unfortunately for him, nature says he, can't be, he can never prove what he thinks. Nature knows definitely that the person who does not believe in God must ultimately be saved from this unbelief by a God in himself. A deity within his own nature must redeem him from the atheism or agnosticism of his outer life. Now, uh, this sounds like it might be a kind of a responsible situation, but young people today are beginning to realize this also. They are beginning to realize that this freedom, this emancipation, this disregard uh, for any form of limitation, restriction, or discipline is not bringing them anything. It is, may, it is may bringing them nothing but misery and misfortune and, frust and frustration and futility. Unless they get back in line and start using their powers as they were intended to be used, unless a service of the world need again takes dominance over the satisfaction of personal ambitions, until that happens the troubles will continue. But the troubles themselves bring about the Reformation. It is because we can't stand ourselves that we change ourselves. And in changing ourselves, we shift leadership from the body consciousness to the being in the body. The body is a kind of Caliban in the tempest. It is a structure that has a kind of intelligence of its own. It is an intelligence that is completely locked into the framework of a human physical structure. The universe of the cells in the body, that universe is the body itself. And in this body, each cell has a kind of mystical uh, individuality, a kind of deep-seated integrity. Cells keep the rules unless we destroy their ability to do so. Cells work together, and the moment they do not work together, the body collapses. So that the cell structure within the individual is a microcosm of the greater world. This microcosm has its natural rules which must be obeyed. This, this body has privileges. It has rights. It is not a slave. It is a conscientious partner with the being that inhabits it. It is the body which as a lesser entity might w worship the mind and consciousness as a god. And that one power in us which rules all body of us is a kind of deity. And every little cell in the pancreas and the kidneys and everything, if it has any understanding inwardly or outwardly, recognizes itself as a citizen in the great economy of a body. And that this common, common, uh, economy of a body is the habitation of a divine power. Our universe is the habitation of a divine power. Our bodies are habitations of a spiritual entities, beings that have the right of leadership and can use this body for the common good. And that is the purpose for which the body desires to be used. If the individual is unselfish in his purposes, temperate in his habits, and dedicated in his purposes, the body will be very comfortable. But the moment the individual breaks the rules, dissipation, all these things, are actually a tyranny of an, an unenlightened mind over a body which it is trying to destroy. So I think we have to get this dichotomy rather well fixed in our mind. The being in the body. 
the being in the body inherits and takes on the body which is next for itself. This body is, it, is the point that it has achieved in the unfoldment of its potentials. In this body it will remain to grow and to live as long as possible. But to live and grow are two different things. To exist does not mean to actually live. It does not mean to benefit. We are in a body to benefit. We may say that the human body is a sort of caravansary, an oasis in a desert. It is a place where we come to learn lessons. The Rosicrucians in their old manifestations said, this world in which we live is the college of the Holy Spirit, the ABC book room of the souls growing in God. This world is a college and a schoolroom, but it is not a college ruled by an academic body of agnostics or those who are simply trying to protect bodies. If a university trains bodies to perpetuate themselves as comfortably as possibly as possible, at the expense of a life within them which is not even mentioned in the curriculum, then the educational system has failed. Because the, fa the purpose of education is to make possible a greater active relationship between the faculties and powers which the individual brings with him into life and the needs of that inner life to grow and protect and manifest itself. If we can begin to think of these things this way, we will find, I think, that it is possible to understand that we can inherit the body. We can inherit bodies from the long streams of bodies, but that the bodies themselves become houses for separate creatures that have the right to rebuild the house if it is uh, inadequate, or the right to destroy it or tear it down by their own perversities. And wherever the body is abused, the being in the body is penalized because it has not more or less effectively guided its own course. It is not up to the being in the body to humor it, to pamper it, to make it master of all purposes. It is supposed that this house shall be adequate for the need of the person living in it, and that in this house he is going to find everything necessary for a useful career, a career of fulfillments. These fulfillments are part of an endless chain of fulfillments. And in the last analysis, what we call the self or the being in the body, the, the consciousness in the body, this dweller has also a long life. This dweller in the body is not immortal. This being in the body is not something that goes on forever, suffering, gaining, losing, hoping, fearing, doubting. This body produces merely a bead in a necklace of embodiments. The being in the body, however, is the thing that grows, not the body. And this growth goes on until ignorance has been overcome until all the vices we associate it with humanity have been corrected, and the individual, having ceased in all ways uh, to be servant of his own ignorance, then passes into a state which is beyond our present contemplation. But it is certain that in the end all things come to enlightenment, and coming to enlightenment come again back to the house of the eternal. But they have to go there by a pilgrimage. And this pilgrimage is life as we know it. And this pilgrimage, we have to help others who are on the same road. We have to share our ways with those in need. We have to rest a little and work a great deal. But we must keep on until we have that achievement, which means that we have finally found the truth about ourselves and about all other things. And in this truth, we come to an absolute recognition of divinity. And we realize that the power behind this is the infinite good uh, which we are all seeking, but which we misunderstand so often as we go along the way. 
But in time, we will all get there, and the bodies themselves will grow, and the bodies in turn will become vehicles for higher forms of life. The evolution goes on. Bodies evolve, and in the infinite course of things, bodies become beings because they always were. But the various cellular structures and organizations must pass like planets and suns and stars through great evolutionary processes. If we treat a body well, we are contributing to our own well-being and adding to the growth of the body. And the body itself is part of another great cycle of eternal life beings uh, that uh, must fulfill a destiny. For someday, the human being himself and the smallest cell in his body must meet somewhere, sometime, on a, on a level of equality. Because they are all parts of one eternal life. And all things different or the same or similar are bound together by an identity of principle, which we have gradually lost by the divisions of intellectualism. So if we can agree with Mendel, bodies can be inherited, but the body only can inherit the body. That which is the life inherits what it has earned, and having entered the body, proceeds to redeem it. And as the alchemists used to say, the final transformation or transmutation is that the conscious or divine will transforms the base metals of its own nature into the pure substances of truth. When this is accomplished, then the great experiment of life is lived. But the body that we have transmuted also continues to grow and to become perhaps sometime in the infinitudes of space a sol solar system or a universe or a mass of uncharted stars. We do not know, but everything is alive and in partnership for the development and perfection of its own potentials. Well, I guess that's it, folks.